uh, I am extremely grateful and delighted uh, that you're allowing me to be here with this uh, wonderful audience. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a professor of history at Columbia College. I teach college students. I teach, I mean, sometimes people ask, what classes do you teach? Well, I, you know, and I, I try to not be overly uh, aggressive with it, but I say, but I teach students. I don't teach classes, but, you know, students, especially 18 year olds, aren't always uh, interested in what I have to say or what I'm professing, right? But I think with this audience, I have uh, met my match. In fact, a, a number of you will probably know a lot more about my subject than I do, but uh, uh, let's let's have fun, right? Um, um, I guess just by way of quick introduction, Steve mentioned, maybe I should tell you a little bit about who I am and where I come from. I was born in Oklahoma. I grew up in a small town without any stoplights. Um, I bounced around, you know, different towns and communities, lived mostly on farms, sometimes in small towns, eventually in a town that had a McDonald's, right? Um, I graduated from Southwestern Oklahoma State University in uh, Weatherford, Oklahoma. That's in a county called Custer County, right? Right. Um, I spent much of my years, I, I grew up in, in Caddo County, Pittsburgh County, Beckham County, and Osage County. So I, I you know, jumped around different places. Maybe you can relate to that story of moving around a lot. Uh, that's certainly what I remember of my childhood and my young years. But uh, I was excited, to be frank, to get out of Oklahoma. So I moved to Toledo, Ohio, earned a, a graduate degree at the University of Toledo, in 1995, a PhD in history. And then um, I taught one year at a community college over here in Kansas. And uh, a vacancy came open at Columbia College. I thought, well, I'll go there for a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> and 28 years later or so, I'm here, right? right? I, I am so grateful. I've loved it. I love uh, Boone County. Um, I mean, this, by this point, right, some of you have stories like that. By this point, I have lived here longer than any other place I've ever lived, right? So, you know, my, I met my wife in Boone County. Uh, my two children have been born in Boone County. Uh, I think I can call this home, right? And I, I, I'm proud to call myself a Missourian now, but there's still a lot I have to learn. And so that brings me to the topic, native ground, the first people of Missouri before statehood. And again, thank you for inviting me here, Laura. I appreciate the invitation. And she's been so communicative with emails uh, and uh, tracking this. And uh, I, I'm uh, so glad that uh, I've had this opportunity. M many of the talks I've done with the Speakers Bureau have been you know, for small groups, this is the first time I've had this kind of setup. I mean, I feel like what Taylor Swift, right? I mean, this is, this is amazing. Uh, I, I feel like beatboxing. I mean, can you get some jams going there, Dave? Uh, but in, anyway, I, I, I'm excited with this crowd. This is a larger crowd. Usually I do kind of little library talks and uh, so St. Genevieve a few weeks ago to, to a group there, you know, 30 or so. So this is much larger than typically I've, I've been around. So I'm, I'm excited about that. So are you ready for my dad joke? Okay. Uh, an old college professor told me that I should start every talk with a bit of humor. So here we go. I am a father, which is the greatest honor of my life. One of the things that I learned from my father was the meaning of the word plethora. It still means a lot to me. Letting it soak in. Dad jokes sometimes elicit groans rather than laughs, but I'm, I'm pleased to hear the laughter. I'm the revising author of Missouri, the heart of the nation. There's a picture here. I brought as a prop here just to prove it. Um, this is an old Missouri history textbook that maybe if you took a Missouri history class some years ago, you, you might have used maybe the third edition or the second edition. This has been around since 1980. 
Bill Parrish and Lawrence Christensen were the original authors. Um, uh, Chris Lawrence, he passed away, I think about five years ago. And, um, and Bill was in, in not conditioned to update it. So he contacted me and asked me if I would uh, undertake it. And, and really, so most of this work is their work. They just added me at the end here. So we, you know, added obviously the, the end chapter, the last chapter, because a lot has changed since 1980. Right. Uh, and then the first chapter, we revised this uh, substantially. It's really kind of a whole new chapter. Uh, not, not anything wrong with the first edition, but some of you might remember in school, the way Missouri history was often taught sort of you begin with maybe a little bit about some French explorers, maybe a little bit about uh, a little bit about some Spanish imperialism. And then boom, you're right into Lewis and Clark and off you go to the rest of the story. So we really added a lot to create a first chapter. And so a lot of what I'm saying tonight, right, is derivative of that first chapter, which is oddly enough, right, entitled, uh, it's titled Native Ground. Um, my talk is, uh, hopefully, you know, informal. I mean, I, I have to also read the room. I you know sometimes I, I lean too much on jokes whenever I don't have much content. So, uh, if I'm slipping into a lot of jokes, then, you know, he's, he's bluffing his way through this, but, but if I can sense that, you know, there are certain topics you have more interest in, I, we, we can certainly drill down and spend more time on that. Uh, and, and on that topic, by the way, of, uh, Drilling down on something, I know a few of you were at Greg Olson's talk last evening at Columbia College. Uh, Greg Olson just published a book titled Indigenous Missourians in Ancient Societies to the Present. Um, and, you know, for years I've been saying, you know, that's a book, you know, before Greg's book came out, that's a book that needs to be written. Somebody needs to write this. Somebody needs to write this. And Greg Olson has written it. And just uh, I, I read it as soon as it came out. Um, and uh, I'd recommend it to you strongly. Um, it's you know, well written, so you know, you know, good. You know, books should be readable, right? But, but more than that, it's almost encyclopedic. Uh, I mean, covers almost everything you might want to know about indigenous peoples from this state before this was even a state, right? And then takes it something I'm not doing with my chapter and talk. He takes the story all the way up to the present, right? Uh, Twenty-seven thousand people, according to the latest census data in the state of Missouri, identify as uh, uh, native in one respect or another, you know, uh, mixed ancestry, combined ancestry, and so on. So th th I think that's uh, worth noting. Presently, there are 500, and uh, I'm, I'm going to leave that slide there just for a moment, uh, 574 Indian tribes in the United States that are federally recognized. Um, and of course, the state of Missouri is home to a plethora. The Osage, Quapa, Oto, Missouri, Iowa, Sock, Fox, Omaha, Peoria, Piankasha, Punka, Ka, and Chickasha all resided in parts of the state before its boundaries appeared uh, on a map. And after the formation of the United States in 1787 and, and the Louisiana Purchase, right, of 1803, more migrating communities uh, settled here. Shawnee, Lenape or Delaware, Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Kickapoo, Kickapoo actually may have had a little bit of an early history. The interesting side story would be the Kickapoo. And then, of course, Cherokee uh, moved uh, into Missouri and through Missouri. Um, the history of the first peoples then really spans at least 12 millennia, and the story continues right, to the present. Um, this is a map of, let me see if I got my laser. There we go a map of some of the groups. Uh, it may be hard to see from where you are. Obviously, this comes from my textbook that I use in my class, First Peoples. Uh, but you can see, obviously, the clustering of groups that uh, are probably most well-known from, from this confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi River valleys. Uh, and again, extending westward in this, you know, beyond the prairies into the plains, you can see large numbers of groups that are you know, related in various ways, you know, culturally, linguistically, 
and historically uh, to some of the groups that might be called more prairie uh, prairie subcultures, right? Uh, and then get into the woodlands, you know, extending eastward. Uh, we have, again, a story that might encompass, you know, more than 500 nations, right? Um, so folks in the show me state often ask, you know, who used to live here? Um, and, and so, you know, we try to answer that. I'm a historian, so that means I don't dig in the ground for bones. I, I don't dig for artifacts that uh, an archaeologist might find. So, you know, some of the answers to those questions can only be answered by Indiana Jones types. Uh, uh, but as a historian, I do rely on documents. And, and again, there are a variety of historians who have, you know, complicated methods. But, you know, what I was trained to do is to go to the archives. And, and so a lot of the information about the people who uh, originally occupied this place right, uh, may not be in the archive. Uh, and so I have to lean on other people's expertise. And of course, to find the answer, maybe it depends on who you ask. Right? Archaeologists disagree greatly. Right? Shocking, right? Uh, but, you know, they seem calm compared to anthropologists. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but, uh, you know, different experts you know, like the old tale of the blind men holding the elephant by different parts and each describing it differently. They, they, they all, you know, have an, a story to tell. So historians want to lean on the documents, right? What, what's in the archive? What's in the record? Uh, but of course, the archival records are partial, they're fragmentary, uh, and they're uh, unfinished. They're, they're still being... Uh, cobbled together. So the Mississippi acquired its name from the Algonquin term Mizijibi. Uh, there's a Z sound in the original Algonquin pronunciation, Mizijibi, which refers to something like a, a sacred river. Now, uh, I, I mean this sort of tongue in cheek, but a lot of uh, Native American words when translated mean something like sacred river, right? Um, so it's hard to know whether that's a, a, a an uppercase uh, reference, right? The sacred river, or just a, a reference, right, to a feeling, a sensation that one gets uh, when you hear the the waters rush up to the shore and you hear right the rolling of a river. I feel that sometimes in places like this, right? So it's a sacred river, right? But nonetheless, that sacred river, Mississippi, literally means the father, I guess, of a great river system that most of you know, Missouri, uh, the Missouri River uh, is connected to, as is the Ohio River and many, many other tributaries. Um, so the people were probably awed by its size. They were awed by the Mississippi River's power. They were awed by its changing currents, its sandbars, its winter ice, its flooding in low-lying zones. They were probably awed by its debris and driftwood. Um, and they were fascinated by it. And so, too, have been many generations subsequently of travelers along the Mississippi River. Explorers, trappers, traders have walked along the shores of the Mississippi River and have been fascinated by its movements, right? As long as the Mississippi River flows, you might say, it has shaped the history of middle America, right? Uh, as I age, you know, when I think of midsection and middle age, these are different concepts, but middle America, right, the mid part of this vast continent, right? There's another distinctive geographical fe feature, of course, in mid America. Uh, for ages, you know, uh, for ages, one kind of looks at the landscapes and sees, uh, of course, the, the rolling hills. Uh, also notice caves. Right, in the state. So there's a, a lot of the caves and the shelters and the and the overhangs and the cliffs that can be very, you know, enticing and and mesmerizing to people. Um, when it's a little bit philosophical and spiritual, but one of the terms sometimes used to describe outcroppings or overhangs is to think about them as enchanting, right? Enchanting, right? So this enchantment with the wild and the, the natural settings around us. This is certainly a great feature of this. And so going to a cave, uh, one can sort of relate to that same experience. And we might imagine some of the first people uh, in relation to these 
geographical features. Uh, Illini guides, right? This is a group of Algonquin speakers. Probably they were Peoria Illini. Illini is kind of a confederacy of different uh, Algonquin speaking groups, but Illini guides probably were the, the first to guide European strangers in, right, into this wilderness, right? Uh, and probably were the voices that pointed to Marquette and Joliet, right? This, that, and the other, right? They were probably sort of naming things, right? And you might imagine based on the records that were preserved by the explorers, right? We've got some things that are perhaps uh, not wholly accurate. Things get lost in translation, don't they? Um, one of the things the guides refer to, right, was this river. Uh, and they spoke of this valley as Miss Hurri or We Missouri. Uh, so that's an Algonquian term, but they probably weren't speaking maybe of the river. They were probably speaking of the people of the river, the people with, if, if we translate this, it means something like the people with the big canoes, right? Um, but the explorers wrote that on a map. <laughs> they wrote that in their journals and then it passed on over time after 16, after the 1670s. Um, so this river, the longest river in the United States, uh, was actually called by the Algonquin speakers Pecatinoe, um, which means something like muddy waters. Yeah. Uh, can I say nailed it, right? I mean, I'm not saying we should go back and read it, but I mean, you know, I mean, nothing wrong with the, you know Missouri as a name, but Pecatune, uh, that, that's got it, right? When encountering this this river, observers almost always agree that it's uh, all muddy. Several American Indian words continue to resonate with the show me state, while every every Chiefs fan thinks that Arrowhead Stadium should be the most important landmark. Uh, there actually are high peaks such as Tom Sock Mountain in Iron County. Uh, the name probably evolved from an Algonquin term. Um, again, lots of debate, but we'll settle on the legend that claims it simply means big, right? That, that seems about right, right? Uh, but, you know, with that legend, of course, is the story of a American Native American chieftain, Tom Sock, which I think that's too good to be believed, right? Tom Sock. And then usually there's a tale of, of sorrow and woe that goes with, uh, goes with maybe a, a Native American princess or something like that. I mean, you guys know how the legends work. So there are lots of versions of the story of Tom Sock's naming, uh, but it does come from the Algonquian in, in some sense. Sock Indians were one of the many groups I ticked off at the very beginning there. Uh, so certainly it fits, right? Let's talk a, a bit about archaeology. Uh, archaeologists insist that ancient bands of hunters and gatherers, or gatherers and hunters, gradually trekked uh, through a, a massive corridor from Siberia to Alaska. Right. This is the, the conventional tale, and, and, and Greg Olson in his book kind of challenges the tale a little bit. It, it might call it the land bridge theory, right? The land bridge theory. And, and, and most, uh, most uh, experts still accept it, but, but there are dissenting views. There are dissenting views. Um, and, and so the, tor the tale of the land bridge, right, based on this, uh, this uh, theory, is that people moved in waves, across space hunting uh, and gathering, and then moving further and further into the interior at the end of the last ice age. But typically that story you know, begins around 12,000 years ago, something like that, maybe even further back. Um, you may have seen, uh, for instance, an AP story this, this week about the White Sands National Park dating. That's, that's pushing the numbers back, the footprints, that are at the White Sands National Park down in New Mexico have been dated to be about 20,000 years old. So, you know, 
a lot, a lot of get. There's, there's obviously spots in Central America. Some of you may know it very well. Uh, caves and whatnot in, in the Yucatan that have bones that have been dated well beyond twelve thousand years ago. Um, so, you know. I'll stick with the conventional theory for now, but, you know, be prepared someday to be shocked right? when everything, right? we call this the paradigm shift, right? When everything uh, changes, right? I often tell my son, right? This is the way it is until it isn't, right? So between 40,000 years ago and 12,000 years ago, <laughs> lots of people moved through North America um, we often describe them as maybe non-sedentary peoples. Uh, we don't know much about their organization. We don't know much about their government. We, we don't know much about their, their political party affiliations. Right? But, but somehow they found ways to survive and advance, right? Survive and advance. And they continue to do that, right? And this is uh, a point, right? Uh, I think uh, you might think of this as the, uh, the uh, the Dalton point, there are lots of different kinds of points that archaeologists have uncovered, but this was found in Missouri. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it in just a moment. The University of Missouri uh, shared this photo with me, so uh, and I love the little ruler there to help me see the size, too, so I kind of get a sense of the set. And the Dalton points, you know, again, I'm no expert in the, in the archaeology, but are usually distinguished by this sort of kind of curvature here, as opposed to a conventional Clovis point, right, which is uh, which is more straight along the side from the from the napping from the flint, uh, work by by the the people who made it. So this is just a little bit uh, of a slight. And it's a little bit smaller to the Dalton points are a little bit smaller than the typical uh, Clovis points. Good. Excellent. Yes. Uh, and the, uh, I, I've been, you, you probably have, have uh, seen this too. I've, I've been uh, 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 amused by, uh, it's an analogy about this kind of, we'll call it the, the, the Dalton point. It's sort of a, a Swiss army knife. In other words, it can be used for multiple things. I'll put it on a stick and you got a spear tied to an allotted. You can you know, throw it further. You can do cutting. <laughs> you can use it for once it get once it gets shaved down, right? You can even turn it into a, a, some kind of a needle or a, a point. It can be used for many, many different things. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we know because of these kinds of uh, artifacts that people came through this land. Um, they left behind lots of artifacts between 40,000 and 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years, right, we can say is a safe bet, right? Maybe longer, but certainly there have been people in Missouri for over 12,000 years, right? Something like that. Um, and due to climate change and uh, perhaps the, the overhunting, right? Uh, there's there's arguments sometimes about the semi-sedentary and non-sedentary peoples having to kind of constantly move along and look for new game, right? In Missouri, right? Mastodon stuff. A park, right? Uh, Missouri was a place there probably were mastodons, lots of oxen, mammoths could have been in the corridor, uh, elk and, and other game. Uh, so, and even, you know, buffalo, of course, ultimately becomes uh, one of the, the primary prey uh, in, in major sections of middle America. So typically scholars refer to these as paleo Indians. Uh, 
some people don't like that phrasing, uh, but I'm kind of sticking with it because I'm a little bit conventional. Uh, paleo Indians, kind of from the root of Paleolithic, right? So it, it's not so much meant to describe uh, a particular culture per se, it's meant to describe more lifestyle, right? Paleolithic, I guess even now, like there's a paleo diet or something like that. So it's kind of more about a lifestyle, right? Um, and there's kind of signs, uh, and I, I've got a crooked number instead of the round number, right? Most people, when they give you round numbers with zeros, you know that they're estimating. <laughs> I've got something that's a little more crooked. That's 9250 BCE. Uh, 9250 BCE. That's that's when there's enough uh, of the articles left behind to indicate that people were staying, right? To staying a, a Graham Cave, for instance, uh, in Montgomery County or in, in other spots uh, uh, down, especially in the river valleys that, that one might find a stack of articles left behind, right? So that's a sign that you're staying in one place. This, you know, uh, again, you can sort of make that connection even without having an archaeology degree, right? So yeah, that's a sign you're here to stay. So 9250 BCE is sort of a, a more confident date we can project to when people were staying in Missouri, not simply passing through, right? Uh, the archaic period typically follows that, demonstrating some significant adaptations among Missouri's occupiers. Um, it continues over a long span of time. Archaic, uh, archaic groups uh, tended to stay in the location, and they tended to look for caves. Uh, they tended to look for sort of natural shelters rather than maybe construct shelters. There were animal skin, small huts, uh, various kind of tent-like wiki-ups, as they're sometimes called, that were uh, constructed, but those are more temporary shelters uh, in the archaic period. This seems to be the tendency for the populations to look for permanent shelter in caves and, and overhangs. So, right, they became less nomadic, more sedentary as the generations passed. They made new weapons. Uh, they hunted for more game. Uh, the Swiss army knife that I mentioned has been found in all 114 of Missouri's counties. It's been found in all 114 of Missouri's counties over the years. Right? So archaeologists have found quite a record of human activity. And the National Historic Landmark, uh, am I pronouncing it right, the Luter River? Am I getting it right? Correct me if my Missouri is mispronounced. Looter, looter. Uh, so it's a creature, right? Uh, like a little, uh, like a little fur-bearing creature, right? But uh, for the river, right? Looter River. Right? Uh, so Grand Cave, Graham Cave. Most of you probably know that uh, is over uh, above the Looter River. That's a, a sandstone rock shelter that uh, is dubbed a National Historic Landmark, landmark with a ten thousand year record, a ten thousand year record of human habitation. The chief development of the woodland period, see, historians think chronologically, so we keep moving through that timeline. The, the woodland period, you know, perhaps around 250 BCE. Again, these are kind of broad swaths of timelines. Um, you might say this is the invention of pottery. This is the craft of firing clay pots and jars, making possible for people to store supplies, food, water, and so forth. Missouri's inhabitants could spend more time than doing some other things. <laughs> if you've got, right, uh, is that Aesop's fable, right? If you've got stuff supplied for the cold, uh, for the cold months, then uh, you know you, you've, you're you're going to be set later in the year. So the storage uh, capacities, I think, uh, are are one of the defining characteristics moving through the archaic period, and and more and more storage, more and more pots, more and more pottery, uh, seems to be characteristic of the archaic lifestyle. They branch out from locations tending to be semi-sedentary still, uh, kind of moving in rotations. You might think like following the seasons. Um, so as things got colder, let's say there's a flood, let's say there's a drought. So people might spread out or disperse and they might come back together when times 
uh, were more conducive for a human experience. Uh, a handful of vessels with decorated, uh, fine decorations, face pottery. I, I love some of the face pottery down in the Mississippi uh, Boot Hill uh, area. Um, uh, pictographic designs, animal motifs. Um, and of course, the big breakthrough in the ar archaic era was the Neolithic Revolution. Um, and, and again, folks who know a lot about uh, a lot about world civilizations can talk about this uh, outbreak called the Neolithic Revolution. It's happening in lots of different places in 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 a relatively close time sequence. Uh, so, but there's no evidence of communication happening. So, people uh, all across the globe are beginning to farm, um, and of course, with more farming. Uh, comes more surplus. So let's talk about Cahokia. The woodland period slipped into what we might call the Mississippian period. Somewhere in here, we might even think about the Hopewell. Uh, I mean, it, there's a lot of diversity that we can drill down on. Um, but uh, from my uh, from from my work in 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 this first chapter, I spent a little bit of time on the Cahokia. Uh, settlement. So it's really a collection of settlements, uh, some 100 or so towns, maybe clustering together with maybe a central town. It, it's it, often described as the American bottom. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting to sort of visualize this. Some of you uh, study the rivers, right? Sort of think about bottom land. Uh, one of the places we farmed when I was a kid, you know, my grandfather kept talking about, you know, well, this is great land. I'm like, I don't know, right? He says, but it's bottom land. I'm like, what? I'd start giggling, you know, but, uh, uh, but you know, rich soil, uh, rich soil. So uh, Cahokia is certainly connected to the American bottom land of the Mississippi, of the Missouri, and of uh, the Illinois River uh, feeding into that. And then just move a little bit further south and you can find the Ohio River feeding it. So it, it's this kind of complex that leads to the development of uh, a great civilization, <laughs> Cahokia. They didn't call themselves Cahokia, right? This is a label we've affixed to this, uh, to this group of people that lived in this vicinity uh, around 1000 CE. They probably had been kind of coming together over, you know, many decades, many centuries, but, you know, most of the scholars who look at the, uh, uh, the sedimentary layers who dig in the dirt uh, have reported that 1054 uh, kind of correlates as a good date for Cahokia as kind of its zenith point. Uh, and that sort of correlates with a celestial nova uh, in, in the heavens. So, you know, one theory, right, is that people are gathering in Cahokia in conjunction with 1054 because of something spiritual, something uh, religious that seems to be occurring, right, in the cosmos and maybe affecting the way people see their own lives. Right? So we change things up. I see a, a Nova. Maybe we got to look for, you know, an explanation of the signs and the wonders that are around us. But again, it's certainly one theory. Many others uh, abound as well. But about twelve to twenty thousand residents uh, concentrated in this in this area. And of course, one of the most distinctive legacies of Cahokia are the mounds, right? And again, you probably know all across Missouri, you can find mounds. Uh, mounds. Um, you can find them in Illinois. You can find them in the Ohio River Valley. Poverty Point, down in Louisiana, there are mounds in many places, uh, but the clustering of mounds is incredible within a 50 mile radius, within a 50 mile radius, uh, hundreds of mounds on the west side, as well as the east side of the Mississippi River. Uh, it was an incredible complex. And the largest of these mounds stood over 100 feet high, uh, stood over 100 feet high. Human sacrifices probably occurred there too. Um, that one of the mounds in particular, I think it's Mound 70 something, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of human bones have been studied that reveal the likelihood of human sacrifices. Uh, but the, you know, the mounds serve many purposes that certainly 
present a platform uh, for communities, maybe avoiding the river <laughs> flooding, right? Uh, certainly could provide some security. Uh, mounds also kind of have this political symbolism, right? Uh, certainly the biggest mound might uh, be the place where the big man, the chieftain, right? The sun king might reside. You know, again, lots of theories about uh, power and politics uh, help us try to make sense of what's been lost to history. Soil erosion, water pollution, and of course, social conflict, conflict may have led to the demise of Cahokia. By 1400, uh, the town had collapsed and the dispersing from Cahokia, the dispersing from Cahokia affected, uh, affected communities up and down the Mississippi and Missouri and the Illinois River Basin, as well as uh, we might imagine uh, the way we perceive then after 1400, the population. So by being, being less sedentary and more dispersed, many of the European explorers in later years, you know, had no idea that there had once been a grand city complex. Um, St. Louis's nickname today, by the way, right, one of its nicknames is uh, Mound City uh, in the 19th century in particular, they often referred as Mound City. But of course, a lot of those mounds have been destroyed, interstates uh, built across St. Louis. Back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, maybe just a different sense about it, but uh, uh, progress, you know, couldn't be stopped by the mounds and they literally just plowed through a number of those mounds. Some have been saved. And of course, uh, very recently, 2007, I think the Osage, I'll say a little bit more about the Osage in a bit. Uh, the Osage have purchased uh, one of the mounds in uh, St. Louis downtown. Uh, but the townspeople in Cahokia probably hunted, gathered, and farmed. They moved up and down. They traded. They traded items that uh, came from hundreds of miles away. Um, there's pottery, highly decorated and shaped in a variety of forms. Uh, they use materials such as flint, stone, bone, antlers, copper, clay, cloth, and wood. There were miners in the area. There's signs of mining uh, along the Merrimack River. Fortified towns probably emerged. Uh, one can see down at the Washington State Park near uh, Potosi, right? Petroglyphs, right? Snakes, birds, rivers, fish. Uh, arrows, weeping eyes in the petroglyphs. I, I've been told there may be some petroglyphs here, right? I've, I've not seen them. Uh, so, some, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, I, I think Greg mentioned that maybe last night. So, uh, excited to see that, uh, to hear that. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about the Osage. Uh, this is uh, a map from the Osage Nation Historic Preservation Office. Uh, it's got, you know, government seal of approval. It's got the Osage seal of approval. So I'm using this uh, with their permission. Andrea Hunter gave this to me uh, some time ago when I was doing some research and uh, I've held on to it over the years. Uh, I, I think it's a stunning visualization. Uh, it's contested a little bit, but I, I'm still using it because I think it makes the point. Um, the most powerful tribal group in the Missouri area um, is the Washage historically. Uh, the name was actually from a Moate division, translates something like the water people, right? Uh, and these people as a whole tended to call themselves Niukonska, which translated more broadly as the children of the waters, right? children of the middle waters, something like that. Uh, and, and of course, later archival records and the federal government, <laughs> through the recognition and treaties has called them the Osage to the Osage. So there's big Osage band, Arkansas band of Osage, little Osage. It's, it's come, there are 21 probably identifiable groups of Osages, right? Uh, but, but, you know, for purposes of understanding their history, we'll just kind of lump them all together as the Osage people uh, who today, mostly, they're not exclusively, live in Osage County, uh, Oklahoma. It's the largest county by area in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I believe there's an Osage County, Missouri. Yeah. There's an Osage River. 
<laughs> so you see signs of Osage right around. Um, Osage language is part of the Degeha Suwen family, uh, connected to the Suwen populations, which of course extend in lots of places across the Great Plains, originally from right, the Great Lakes region. So the, the Osage language is shared among lots of different tribal groups. The Ka, the Ponca, the Omaha, and the Quapaw are the most closely related linguistically. Uh, the Osage say that their ancient ancestors once lived among the stars. The sun is their grandfather. The moon is their grandmother. They speak of having descended from an above world and then landing here in middle world. Dangers arose, but those dangers came from the below world, right? which could set humans adrift and disrupt our, our lives. And so we always have to be aware of the things that lie below. Right? Animals can help. Human beings survive. According to the old tales, animals often play a pivotal role. The elk, right? the buffalo. And some of the clans sort of take these different animals as symbols. Um, uh, my, my aunt uh, is from the buffalo clan of the Osage. Uh, and when I was a kid, she would tell me about, the, the, I'm not a member of the Osage, but my aunt was a member and she would tell me about and, you know, I was like, can I go outside and play? You know, I, I, I wish that you know, I listened to my aunt. She had so many things to tell me and I, I didn't pay attention. Uh, uh, but one of the things she liked to say is that the Osage have always lived with uncertainty, confusion, disarray, and have always survived. So the, the old tales suggest that the Osage, again, this is a little bit outside the realm of history and more in the realm of archaeology, but the Osage probably migrated down the Ohio River Valley um, over centuries. When Cahokia was at its zenith, they moved into the suburbs. Right? Sometime after Cahokia's collapse, they moved westward down the Missouri River. Right? Um, ballparking it then, you know, certainly Osage inhabitation of Missouri yeah, goes back a thousand years, something like that. Um, a long time, 500 years, right? Feel comfortable with that, right? Again, arguing this, that the Osage have a saying, uh, we are always they would say, coming to a new country. I, I've thought about that. I mean, again, scholars smarter than me have spent a lot of time thinking about that. It doesn't mean just moving from place to place, right? We're always coming to a new country. It's a figure of speech to express also a mindset, right? I'm always able to change and I can handle change, right? Something like that. Right? I'm always coming to a new country, right? I'm always coming to a new country. I, I like that. Uh, if, I had a, if I had a chance, I'd put it on a red trucker hat and sell it to people, right? The Osage believe they could adapt to almost anything. They could live in the woodlands. They could live in the prairies. They could adapt to the plains, right? According to John Joseph Matthews, a renowned Osage writer of the 20th century, the oral tradition tells of an unfamiliar world divided into land and water. And after a period of chaos, they organize themselves into three groups that still exist today. And they selected a group of elders, according to their ancient stories, the Nohejinga, or the little old men, the little old men who preserved their memories and stories and passed them on word of mouth, generation after generation. So there's a hereditary line of chiefs and uh, leaders, elders that uh, uh, remain important. Wakanda is a, a, an Osage term to describe the supreme mystery force of the, the cosmos, the sun, the wind, the energy. Again, it's, it's hard to translate some terms, but Wakanda, uh, Wakan, Wakanda, right, is a way of describing, right, the great spirit, something like that. 
research shows that the Osage, uh, that the Osage way of life represents a kind of blending. Then the spring hunts began typically in the spring, right? In March. And they lasted through the summer, right? Makes sense. Meanwhile, right, it's not always as simple as men went out hunting and women stayed home, but there is a kind of division of labor. Uh, and very often the women took care of fields of corn, beans, and pumpkins. Uh, men uh, typically left the villages in late August to go on long hunts, kind of difference between a short hunt. If we have any hunters in here, you know, I'm talking about difference between a short hunt and a long hunt. Long hunt, you'd be gone for months, right? Uh, and then return. This is typically when they began exploiting the buffalo, uh, the buffalo herds on the Great Plains. So they go a longer hunt and expedition. The bison provided meat, hides, and bones for tools, shelter, ornaments. Uh, but of course, they also hunted deer, elk, bear, bear, Ooh. wolf, raccoon, fox, wildcat. They hunted porcupine. Now, a lot of the costumes, and uh, you might know, porcupine quills often become part of the the dance, uh, the dance clothing. Weasel, muskrat, beaver. This uh, lots of creatures uh, became their prey. The Osage name for horse is Kawa, which translates roughly as mystery dog. <laughs> um, you know the the name Kawa. And, and this is more the research I, I did in, in uh, my second book. The, the co probably comes from the tribal group Kiowa. Uh, so they probably traded for horses from the Kiowa or stole horses from the Kiowa, right? And, and thus they built up their herds one way or the other. And so they simply, you know, used the name Kiowa, Kawa in some way to signify these amazing creatures, right? Those age households, the lodges, you know, faced east why why east see the sun yeah. yeah the the lodges were usually oval with a domed roof and cattail mats uh some lodges measured over 100 feet in length um but that's not typical long houses or lodges that were more typical the iroquois speakers and right? Uh, Osage lodges typically were smaller, kind of think of really serving a, a sort of doing the finger quotes, nuclear family unit, a smaller family, I mean, about housing and so forth. Uh, of course, the new global empires of Europe arose, say, in the 18th century, and thus the Osage, who numbered about 15,000 in Missouri, uh, had to adapt. They traded with the French, they offered skins, hides, furs. Furs, uh, tallow, oil, and food to French guests, and they they sometimes described the French as instahe, uh, which translates the men with the heavy eyebrows. Uh, they acquired metal goods. The, the Osage acquired knives, awls, hoes, needles. This sounds good because it makes life easier. But one of the again, this is kind of getting into the historical arguments a bit. But one of the problems with this is they, in some ways, then become dependent upon these manufactured goods, right? They sort of lose some of their old skills, right, as they become dependent to some extent on the French. Of course, there's counter arguments that, well, but the French need the Osage more than the Osage needed them. Uh, and so the Osage are often looking for new trading partners and, and they're willing because they, you know, the Osage, you know, are able to control some uh, 100,000 square miles of territory. So they say, look, we'll, we'll go to the Spanish or we'll go to the, the English or, or something like that. But, you know, that's an argument uh, to interpret what's happening. But we do see the Osage adapting to the presence of the European empires. The Osage expanded their hunting. They divided into bands. They organized and reorganized. There's a term some ethno historians use. It's called ethnogenesis. So they're constantly reinventing themselves and, and their identities. They're adapting captives uh, through traditional practices and ceremonies that are sometimes called, you know, covering the dead. So if someone is lost, if someone is killed on a raid, you may take somebody else to replace them uh, on a captivity run, on, on a raiding party. So the Osage maintained themselves quite powerfully. And most of the other tribes, especially the Algonquian speakers, uh, kept their distance. 
right? John Joseph Matthews, who I mentioned before, once described the Osage of the 18th century as among the most violent groups uh, of the midsection of the continent. Uh, I'm, I don't have a, a watch. I just realized I might be going on too long. I, I don't want to. Oh, it's 804. So. Uh, Why the most violent? Weaponry, right? Weaponry. Uh, firearms, in particular, the Osage were able to acquire firearms, They're sometimes called fire sticks, right? And they were became greatly skilled at using them even on horseback, which is a hard thing to do. So a lot of the other groups that didn't have horses, that didn't have fire sticks, sort of said, whoa, keep our distance. So violence in that sense that the, the Osage dominated. Um, uh, dominant. Yeah, dominant, maybe that's the word that we should use, right? Uh, and of course, you know, I've got my notes here. I'm going to jump through the story of Lewis and Clark. You already know it. Uh, let me mention President Thomas Jefferson. You, you might know this. President Thomas Jefferson, after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, planned to, to make Missouri Territory Indian Territory. He actually discussed with his cabinet, we have records. This is the historian in me, right? We have records in which... He proposed a constitutional amendment. It would have been the 13th Amendment. He proposed a constitutional amendment that would have set aside the territory of, at that time, they hadn't named it Missouri yet, but the territory from the Louisiana Purchase, right? Set aside much of that for Native Americans. Some of his cabinet members pushed back and said, you've got to rethink that, man. You're going to run for re-election someday. And so he put it in his desk and, and moved on, right? But it's interesting to think about. Uh, the War of 1812 came, uh, and, and of course, many Native groups played roles in that. Sometimes, uh, according to the newspapers, right, another source historians sometimes find tricky, uh, Natives were on the, quote, war path. So let me read from the Missouri Gazette on May 28, 1814, during the War of 1812, uh, as Missouri Gazette described, quote, we are informed that a white man has been discovered floating down the Missouri, apparently dead. Depends on what group he was floating with. I mean, you know, he's been dead for four or five days. He's, he was tomahawked, stabbed, scalped. The blood, this is in uppercase, blood, right? When my, when my kids see me text them with uppercase letters, they know they're, that I'm angry. The blood of our citizens cry loud for uppercase vengeance. The general cry is let the north and south of Missouri be uppercase Jacksonized. Jacksonized. I thought that I was so curious. What might that mean? If this were a college classroom. I'd say, let's talk about this. Jacksonized. What could the newspaper mean? Okay. It's a reference to General Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, who's reigning terror on Muskoki people at Horseshoe Bend at this very time, right? and quickly countermarching from Horseshoe Bend down to New Orleans, where he's going to rain terror on the British, you probably know in the Battle of New Orleans. So this is reference to Andrew Jackson, right? And I guess the newspaper would like to see a county in Missouri, maybe named for Jackson someday. All right, jump forward here. After the War of 1812, let me say, and, and kind of sum up here, it would take until 1837, but Missouri's tribal groups were all removed. Uh, it didn't happen all at once. It happened through a series of treaties, right? The federal government negotiated 20 treaties with 13 different tribal groups uh, to push them out of this area. Historians have to recognize, despite our blind spots, that Missouri, right, was truly native ground. 
And Native stories help us understand something about that past. The records have to be re-examined and continuously re-examined. And new information has to be found to help us complete our picture of what Missouri was once like and what Missouri can still be. Right? Over the ages, Missouri's abundance of animals, plants, and freshwater sustained a plethora of people. And it still can. Native stories of origin illuminate our worlds of wonder, and Missourians today uh, remember the first peoples. So in closing, thank you. Thank you for your hospitality and your attention, and, and I don't want to take any more of your time, so uh, thank you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Good. And I can repeat a question if. Well, I have a plethora of questions. Ah. <laughs> I'm just really curious about this map showing that kind of leg going up the Ohio River Valley all the way to Pennsylvania. For real? I and mean, the Osage, that's them. According to, yeah, yeah, the question was that this, the map shows uh, Osage territory extending all the way to Pennsylvania in the east. Uh, following the Ohio River Valley. Uh, this is according to the Osage Nation Historic Preservation Office. Um, now, I don't want to, you know, argue the point too much, but we could probably speak to other tribal nations, other tribal groups, and they might contest this just a bit. Uh, but the claims of Osage uh, populations having moved down the, the Ohio River Valley uh, dating back, you know, centuries. Yeah. And so that, those claims, I, again, uh, this is kind of part of the arguments about sovereignty and treaty rights. So, you know, one of the things the Osage are doing today, and, and they're becoming far more active politically, right, is they're, they're asserting the biggest claims, right? Uh, so that entails all kinds of things about, you know, repatriation of artifacts or, you know, other, other matters that might, you know, fall under the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs or something like that. So this, they're, ex, they're ex extending their claims accordingly based on this, uh, this, this map. Uh, I talked to a lawyer once who said he can't do anything in this territory without checking. I'm, I'm kidding, right? Without checking with the other states. This is right now. Yeah. Well, yes, sir. Uh, your map there has an, what appears to be an alphabet right under the words Osage Ancestral Territory. Did they have an alphabetic uh, system of writing? And what are those? Where do those letters come from? What are they? What are they? I cannot decipher it and I can't tell you much about it. It's a superb question. Um, it's the Gehan Su. Um, I don't know anything about it other than the Ka the Kansa and others also speak that. And so the transcription and the recording of this is probably a, a more kind of 19th century phenomena, right? Um, but that's the best I can tell you about it. If anybody else knows more about the Osage language, um, you know, feel free to jump in. My aunt spoke Osage, my, my cousin spoke Osage, and I said, uh, can I go outside? I mean, again, a kid doesn't know what's going on sometimes, right? Uh, and so I missed out on learning a lot more uh, in Osage County. Yeah. Please tell me. Basically, their godmother up in and uh, the story goes that she fought off an Indian attack. I don't know. Hello, Jeff City. Yeah. Uh, probably not as well as I should be. Yeah. Apparently, there was a Saying the same French or 
supposedly there was an attack there and they were they were attacked by a Navy airman and they managed to fight them off and put off the fire and then they their chamber fires. <laughs> That's a pretty powerful weapon. So War of 1812 period, right? Uh, raids, skirmishes, attacks, all up and down. Of course, there's a battle over near north of St. Louis called the Battle of the Sinkhole that included the Sock and Fox Indians. I think Miami Indians sometimes were reported uh, ha having committed uh, attacks on settlements. Yeah, I, I think that there are frequent frequent uh, examples of this uh, across the landscape during the War of 1812. And so this precipitates, right, the treaty making to push uh, Native peoples out after the war up until 1837. Very good presentation. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> some, some accounts and journal entries support exactly what you're saying about the Crusade and how they were looked at as early as the early in the and one of those now it's working um is henry rose schoolcraft in his uh, journal through the ozarks he mentions the the osage uh quite a lot quite frequently and less so about other Indian tribes that were living in very close proximity to um, white settlement. So the readers left with um, the belief that maybe um, that folks at that time had this fear of the Osage and, and maybe it was a, an ill-conceived fear uh, because even by that time they had moved through the state. Are there other journals that you know of, firsthand journals that would um, corroborate some of that or talk about those types of uh, uh, situations in that early 19th century period. Mm -hmm. Journals. Well, that's, a, you mentioned schoolcraft. Uh, Stephen Long, uh, I think he, it may be a little bit, little bit later, 1820 or so, uh, was military officers. Uh, again, uh, Nathan Boone uh, comes across more like 1830s. Uh, so military journals, uh, I'm thinking of anything else that might be of interest. I, I just can't think of anything off the top of my head. You know, the political figures like William Clark, who's over in St. Louis, he's essentially kind of the in charge. He was governor of the territory. And then after he ran for governor of the state, lost, but hangs around Missouri, kind of in charge of Indian affairs in, in the region. And a lot of the, the collection that makes up uh, uh, what you find at the at the base of the arch. <laughs> Uh, the, the Westward Expansion Memorial. That, that's uh, that's from William Clark's collection. So he wrote a lot about the Indian groups that he encountered through St. Louis. I mean, St. Louis at the time would have been, you know, yes, settlers, a few thousand, but more and more people, Native Americans, passing through, trading, and then moving on. Uh, that probably would have been a frequent experience in the 1820s for a little frontier town. Um, and he negotiated a lot of the treaties for at Portage de Sioux, which is north of St. Louis, and he wrote records about every one of those treaties. So he would have probably described some of the details, maybe not as eloquently as Schoolcraft, but uh, uh, would be a primary source that a historian would lean on. Um, that's the best I can do there. That's a great question. I, I love questions that kind of cause me, and I took a note here. It's like, go see if I can find a bit more. That's good. Hello, nothing here. Check, 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 check. Can you talk about the uh, Big Eddy site down below Stockton Dam? The, the archaeological items they found down there? I can't, but can you? Well, <laughs> I just know 12 to 14,000 years. Um, is the 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 oldest that they saw i mean 10 years ago it was the oldest record of of humans in north america but that had that's changed since then but 
Big Eddy site. The Big Eddy site. Yeah, it's down below Stockton Lake Dam, and it's been washing away <laughs> the mud for the last 50 years. And they started, of course, there were all kinds of points found, and they just kept finding them the further it went down. Okay. Um. Um, oh, you guys, before we get to the next question, I do just want to remind everyone, like really helps if you hold that microphone right up to your mouth, you know, just within an inch of your mouth, that's where they work. So just a little reminder about that. And one thing that I think is really cool about the Big Eddie site is that my understanding, which I don't know anything, honestly, I'm an English major. I, I literally know nothing, but, um, that archaeologists just they just didn't dig deeper than 9000 years in Missouri because they didn't believe people lived here nine more than 9000 years ago and certainly not more than 10000 years ago and the big eddy site was some place where the river did the excavating for them and they're like oh well, the, this is 12000 years but there's still stuff coming out you know um and i think that's really cool too you know that um Sometimes nature just has to do the work for us. Okay, I'm not sure if you would know this, so, but pop culture question. Did Marvel take Wakanda from the Osage? Osage? <laughs> I, I, I don't believe so. I'm, I'm trying to remember how far back the Marvel comic series Black Panther goes in 60s 1960s so they were talking about wakanda in the 1960s that doesn't predate the osage use of the term wakanda uh the best i can tell so the osage have the i guess their older claim to wakanda but i, I don't know it, it is interesting i was at a school group you might imagine i was talking about the osage and talking about wakanda and, and had some eyes suddenly listen I mean, they're looking up it's like wow is he going to talk about something interesting all right, I'm gonna listen to that, but uh, I don't know. But yeah, that's a it's fun. What Wakan Wakan is a Siouan word for all the Siouan dialects. Wakan is typically used to just describe spirit. Wakan. So someone in in again Siouan dialects, someone who is a holy man or a spirit man might be called Wakan Wichasha Wichasha Wakan. So Wakan is just kind of this very important concept through a lot of the Siouan dialects. Right? Wakanda is just a way of saying the great spirit, something like that. Yeah. Matt, period. Okay, here's it. What the earliest European close? Well, curious what the earliest European said about yeah. far away. Wireless is too far away, right? No. Are you waiting on me to talk? Are you fixing it? Okay, there it is. All right. I just wanted to know what the earliest European contact uh, in Middle Missouri said about the natives that were here at that time. The the earliest recorded encounters are from 1673, I believe, that Marquette and Juliet's journey down the Mississippi River. Uh, land of the Missouri River, that, that their descriptions have been preserved and that is archived uh, and their maps, the, the maps that they created. Or the, how about up the Missouri River? I don't know how far they went. Um, does anybody know that the distance? I, I just don't know the, the distance. I don't think they went up the Missouri River. Yeah. It's it turned at the mouth at the confluence. Just went down. Yeah, and then it just went down. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry. But like de Bourgemont would have been maybe one of the people that left, one of the French people that left actual writings and journals, I think. 
Bush might. Hmm. I, I think so. All right. I was glad to hear you talk about Thomas Jefferson uh, using Missouri as like a border between the Americans and the native peoples, but also Spain had the same idea, but they wanted to keep the Americans out. So they gave Spanish land grants to the uh, Delaware and the Shawnee, the Shawnee, the same people that had fought Daniel Boone back in Kentucky. And he became friends with them uh, up in uh, Jamestown, Missouri which is now like North St. Louis County. It's a great point. Yeah. The, the idea of buffering uh, is essential in borderlands, right? And, and maybe again, conceptually speaking, the, uh, Stephen Aaron, who's a historian in, in, in California, wrote a book called uh, American Confluence on kind of the meeting of rivers here in Missouri. But he said, you know, that so many different nations, including the United States, <laughs> look for buffers on their borders. And Missouri was for a long time a buffer. So maybe think of it as a borderland instead of as a frontier, right? A borderland rather than a frontier. Just a conceptual thing. But I like certainly the Spanish <laughs> wanted a buffer because the Americans were coming, they, they feared. Um, sounds like I still have a mic and I, I have a question. Yeah. So you mentioned about the Osage moving to down the Ohio River Valley and then being part of the Cahokia cultural explosion or whatever happened there. Uh, I Kind of recently, I just kind of keep hearing this reference to, um, and I'm not sure if this is like Osage historians now that are saying this because I'm just not totally in tune with it, but that perhaps the Osage really were like some of the actual religious leaders in Cahokia and maybe some of the last people to stay there as the civilization kind of collapsed and then and then they moved from there. Is that like, I know that you've been hearing a lot of different things too. What kind of stuff have you heard in, in that vein? Someplace in my notes, I, I, I'm sketching over some of those arguments. And and again, Andrea Hunter at the, uh, OSA, it's what I do when I don't know answers. I go talk right. to Andrea Hunter. She's an archaeologist and anthropologist who works with the Osage tribe. And uh, in some of the materials she sent me, uh, she drills down on that argument, that, that, that thesis, uh, to some extent. Um, the Osage were a powerful group. Uh, among the complex of groups that m comprised Cahokia, which again, wasn't called Cahokia. We don't know what it was called, right? Cahokia was a name that was added later in reference to a small tribal group that the Spanish, uh, I think it was the Spanish encountered uh, to the east. And I said, all right, so Cahokia, that must be the name that uh, goes with the, the mounds. Um, but uh, that, I, I think you're right. I, I think, that, again, with anthropology and archaeology, there's always this kind of cutting edge. And, and I think that's probably where the, the argument about the Osage movements uh, is moving, that they played a central role. Um, but um, I'm still learning. Um, the question I had involved the... A lot of the things I've kind of heard are mostly from the kind of European from the Eastern way toward the Osage. What was it uh, more along the lines of the uh, Missouri on the Western side? What was the essentially interactions between the different tribes toward the Western side of Missouri than the Eastern side when they were coming across or European settlers? That's a great question. Uh, I, I can mention the story of the Kiowa because of the horse connection. Uh, interaction with Caddo people, Caddoans uh, make up uh, a large group of people in the in the lower plains, southern plains, uh, and then uh, again moving up the upper plains, the Ponca and uh, Pawnee peoples. And some some of this is about kin and kind, uh, but uh, up in the central plains, there are lots of groups that they interact with, mostly through trade. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, kind of those long hunts, uh, sometimes they might do this uh, in lands that 
I'm doing the finger quotes. It's annoying. I'm sorry. Hunting grounds, right? Hunting grounds, uh, which of course many different groups would have utilized uh, you know, a shared uh, a, a shared resource that didn't belong to anybody personally, didn't belong to one tribal group, right? That sort of thing. Uh, so uh, it's, it's generally cooperative when you look to the West. Uh, the combativeness, right? I'm still kind of fishing for that word that John Joseph Matthews used, violent, uh, in the 18th century was probably targeted more toward the Algonquin peoples on the other side. Is there one more in the back? Maybe this will be our last question. We'll see. So um, I was in a museum in, outside of Fort Myers, Florida, Calusa Mound Builders out of Shell Mounds. And there was a chunk of Galena from Missouri, lead sulfide that must have been traded down the Mississippi. Have you encountered any of the record, any in the written record descriptions of um, native tribes introducing the French to the lead deposits in Southeast Missouri? Or do you know anything about tribal uh, connection to uh, mining lead? Does anybody know something? I, I think I hear somebody. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like can you, can you tell me a little bit? State. Only that um, that uh, Native Americans introduced the French to lead ore in Missouri, and it just exploded after that. But I, I don't know any details other than that. Yeah. Beginning right in the eighteenth century, it's kind of the the same period of the Osage imperialism, right? the Osage hegemony over this region in the eighteenth century. So it it certainly correlates but i don't know anything yeah well awesome questions you guys um and brad thank you so much for this really like broad and yet really detailed and rich look at some of the history from just right around here going back thousands of years um and bringing your own personal perspective to it thank you so much um i I also want to, you know, mention before the clapping begins, uh, Brad has seven books published, and I think he has a few here today. So maybe if you harass him real quick, you could uh, uh, perhaps purchase one of those. Um, but again, thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. I, I probably have answered many questions with the phrase, I don't know. I, I, it, I guess that's one of my go-tos because right? there's so much I don't know, but thank you for teaching me a little bit. And I've got a few notes here that I've taken from, and I'm going to try to keep learning. And maybe next time, if I run into someplace, I'll know a little bit more, or you can tell me a little bit more, but thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you.